afternoon. Uh, I want to tell you uh, a story. I'm going to start out with a story today, and it's one of the most famous stories of painting. And you've probably heard it before, but I think it kind of sets the stage for the body of work that I'm uh, presenting to you today. The name of the story is called The Grace of Zeuxis. And it's a familiar, iconic story. It's set in the 5th century BC, and it was told by Pliny the Elder. And the story goes like this. Uh, there are two competitive painters, uh, Zeuxis and Parahasius, and uh, they were trying to outdo each other with their work all the time. Uh, Zeuxis could paint grapes so effectively that the birds would swoop down from heaven to peck at his painting, they said. And so one day, uh, Parahasius asks uh, his friend Zeuxis to come over and take a look at the painting in the studio. And so Zeuxis arrives on the spot, uh, looks at the painting, walks toward it and starts to remove the cloth that's hanging in front of the painting until he gets up to it and, and to his horror and his shock, he realizes that it's a painted cloth and that he's been had. He's, he said he has to concede that uh, Parhasius is the greatest, greater painter of the two because he said, uh, I can fool the birds of the air with my paintings, but uh, you, Parhasius, have fooled me, a painter. And the story it does a couple of things. It points out the exalted position that realism has had in contemporary, uh, not so much contemporary painting, but in traditional realist painting. It's, it's, the, it's sort of the standard in a way. Uh, some, uh, one test, at least for traditional art, is, uh, is, is for a moment, do you take a double take and do you look at the painting and get so caught up for it that maybe you believe for a second that the painted cr uh, world that is on the surface of that canvas is an actual, real, uh, three-dimensional kind of world. The question I'm uh, thinking about with this work is about the nature of looking. And I think the, the story of Zeuxis and Parhasius is largely about how we look at paintings. Do you believe it? Do you buy into that space? There are other things that can be considered uh, in paintings. And what I was thinking about especially is, why is it that we spend the time to dart our eyes about a static, two-dimensional, and kind of useless object that a painting is? But some paintings are really compelling to look at. You want to you want to stare at them. You end up kind of um, almost not exactly meditating upon them. But they can, paintings can be meditative, and they can draw you into almost like in a mandala kind of way to look at them. Um, the paintings, these paintings, to a large extent, as as the rest of my work comes out of what I'm reading. Uh, for many years, I've spent time. Um, uh, reading the works of James Joyce, uh, especially his Ulysses, but especially Finnegan's Wake. I've done a lot of work in relation to that. And since uh, I teach painting at uh, McNeese State University in Lake Charles, I spend a lot of time reading art journals and periodicals. And one book that I read while I was making this body of work was called The Self-Aware Image by Victor Stoichi Stoichita. And, uh, and I'll bring in to, into the, my comments some of uh, how that work plays out in these paintings. The title of the show is Lacuna, which means void or opening. And very often, so the parts of the paintings uh, that I like to look at are the parts that are the, the nothing part of the paintings, the empty space in the paintings. And it might be the space behind the rendered object, or next to, or within the object that's there. And oftentimes, these spaces are, are intriguing just because they're a little bit mysterious. and they, this, the space of that nothingness, and it sounds kind of zen in a way, is a, a space that can be meditative and, uh, as, and mesmeric at the same time. It's also a place where your imagination can wander around if you look at, at, at these, some, some of these voids or these empty spaces. Another consideration I have in this work oops, is that, it, uh, that I'm interested in uh, illogical spaces, ambiguous spaces, and as well in, as into, uh, into errors in painting. Um, how far can you push a mistake? And is a spatial representation or a misrepresentation, uh, how does it make a painting compelling? And so I'm examining errors in, in a, a portion of it. Uh, the painting uh, over here that's uh, behind me uh, is called uh, His Curtain, references the story of the grapes of Zeuxis. But in this one, uh, the painting in a way sort of sets the stage for the rest of the show because the curtain reveals really nothing. It's a void back there. It's, sort of, it's an empty space. <coughs> There's count, there are countless paintings from the history of art that bridge the space between the viewer and the painted or created world in the painting with uh, a painted curtain. And that, the, uh, the painted curtain often situates you 
maybe in the shadows, you might be at a certain distance, a certain eye level from the action of what's going on within the painting. There are other devices that do the same thing. Uh, there are window sills sometimes, sometimes there are doorways that situate the viewer at a certain remove, or they kind of tell you where you are in relation to a painting. And it's, it's interesting to look at, especially traditional paintings, if you look at Vermeer, for a, the, probably the best example. If you look through Vermeer, there are countless doorways and windows and, and curtains that frame his paintings. And one way that a painting can be viewed, even if there is no curtain or window or doorway or something, is as a pseudo window set into a wall. And the painting over here uh, that's called Catan's Window is meant to do just that. Uh, I like the idea that sometimes a painting can pierce the space of a wall. That you can look through it and kind of imagine a space that maybe is beyond that wall, that you kind of can put yourself out there. Uh, the Catan in question uh, in relation to this painting is the great uh, Spanish Baroque painter Juan Sanchez Catan. Uh, Cotan was famous for, his, probably his most famous painting is this lovely painting of this arc of these, uh, it's a, a hanging quince, a cabbage, uh, a melon, and a cucumber on a shelf. And I've always loved that painting, and I thought I knew the work of Juan Sanchez Cotan. But when I was reading the book, uh, The Self-Aware Image, that I mentioned a minute ago, I came across a description of a painting that I'd never heard of before, never, and I've definitely never seen it before. Uh, late in life, Cotan entered a Carthusian uh, monastery as a lay brother. And while he was in the monastery, he, he continued to paint. And in the inventory of his possessions, there was described a painting that was an empty windowsill, absent all the vegetable fruit that he would normally put in, in his paintings. And I thought, well, um, that, that definitely was the source for this painting here. I used the proportions of the windowsill that are in his famous uh, quince cabbage uh, melon and cucumber painting, uh, but it's, it's meant as a as sort of an homage to uh, Catan in some ways. A work that's pretty much the opposite of, uh, of that, of, the, uh, of that window painting, is this one over here called Her Devotions. Uh, in my uh, closet, I have a, besides my shoes, my clothes, uh, from wall, from floor to ceiling, the walls are covered with devotional images. There are medals and plaques and rosaries and statues and all of those things. And that bag is in there as well. And uh, so it's, it is a, a bag hanging in uh, an impossibly empty space uh, that's there. The painting here behind me uh, is called Snare, Dropping a Quiet Work in Progress. And this one uh, is based upon uh, James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. Uh, it, it's a really a chronicle of my passage of time going through uh, making work in relation to Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. There are um, references to small paintings that I've done before, so it's paintings of paintings as well as objects that are present there, paintings of postcards of objects, reproductions of them. Um, the reason it's called Work in Progress is because Joyce's title for uh, Finnegan's Wake while he was working on it was called Work in Progress. And, uh, and still, and, and then my, uh, maybe somewhat of an ironic uh, take for the title is that this, my uh, work on Finnegan's Wake is still not over with yet. I'm still, after 20 years plus, working on that book. I'm, I, I haven't anywhere near gotten to the middle of it, much less the bottom of it. And uh, so I'm happily caught in the snare of that book. Uh, at the bottom, you might notice a little hand. Uh, in Finnegan's Wake, there is a, an adorable little hen named Belinda. And Belinda scratches around in the midden heap, and she finds a letter in the midden heap. And that letter is Finnegan's Wake, which is something you know, as a great touch of that Joyce. But this Belinda is about to participate in a chicken drop. Uh, and I believe that Joyce would really approve of the notion of a chicken drop, because after all, Joyce said that the essence of Irish humor was scatology. And so, and some of you, I think most of you know that the way a chicken drop works is that there's a piece of plywood with some numbers on it, and uh, each a person, every person in the room uh, takes a bet, maybe bets a dollar or so on each square in hopes that the chicken will make his business on that particular square. And if the chicken uh, does, then you win that whole pile of money. So it's, it's just a, it's, it's something of a, a Joycean scatological joke going on in here. <laughs> Uh, the painting itself uh, is loosely based on an installation that I made in my studio. I've 
I pinned up a lot of, some of the things were actual paintings, some of these things are hanging in different parts of my studio, and um, I have a little metal chicken <laughs> that looks like that. And, and so it's, uh, it's in amidst all the Joycean images, there are also elisions, there are, there are gaps, there are holes that kind of pierce the, 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 the wall, you might say, of, of this uh, surface of this painting. Uh, and the wall itself is something like a wall that you might see in a sound, in a sound stage. It's sort of impossible. It's like a, a, a scrim that uh, is uh, loaded in the back there. There's a, a painting in the next room uh, that's a, uh, based upon Finnegan's Wake as well. It's called Study for the Magazine Wall. And the magazine wall is the central location of Finnegan's Wake. And it's, uh, it's a, a fort that actually it is still standing in, in Dublin at this time. In this transitional hallway area, there's a work called Real House, and uh, it's it's a, a work something like uh, Cotan's window, but it suggests a window without the framework around it. It's just kind of kind of plumped onto the wall, I'd say. If you walk past it from a distance, I think you see that um, this uh, building in the background. As you move up close to the painting. You, you'll notice some droplets of water, and as you stand in front of it, I think you'll have this experience of your eyes of looking that you kind of, uh, you, you see it on one level of the water drops at one point, and then you kind of look beyond it to the, the building, and then you come back again. So it's, it's meant to be this experience of, of just looking, of curious kind of looking for you. Several of the paintings uh, that are in the second gallery depict uh, these ambiguous spaces using mirrors. And uh, there's a, a touch of irrationality or illogic in a lot of those paintings. And I'm, if some of you may have heard this quote from Eugene uh, Delacroix, he said that in order to finish a painting, you've got to spoil it a little bit. I love that idea. Uh, I mean, who doesn't spoil a painting anyway? But so there are some pa painters and some uh, artists who use mistakes as really a part of the strategy of the work. The incorporation of errors really comes into it. I think if you look at Cezanne's paintings, it is, they're absolutely riddled with perspective issues. And, but, but happily so, I think, I think they're, they're brilliant and they're rapturous. But the ambiguity of the space that's in a Cezanne painting is in part what makes those paintings compelling. And so I was playing with that idea in the <coughs> paintings that have uh, the mirror images. There are three of them uh, in, the, uh, in the second gallery in there. This, uh, this large painting here has so much uh, going on, and you, you talked about the chicken drop, which was wonderful and charming. But <clears throat> for instance, on, the, on the, that bottom there, there's a, there's a trap and a gold ring, it looks like. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there are any other pieces in there that mean something that you felt like you, you wanted to incorporate. Yeah, definitely so. The, the trap, the, the snare, these kind of traps that are there is kind of for me because I'm, I'm trapped in a very, uh, in a happy kind of way in Finnegan's Wake. I, I really, I don't, I don't feel that in a negative way whatsoever, but it's, it's a wonderful book and it's, uh, it's kind of, a, it's a lovely space to be. Uh, the, the ring that's there is, it's a, and that is a little joke, a little joke. The, uh, Hen Belinda there, she's a metal hen, and she's dropped a point. I would say that's what dropping a point was about. She has dropped this little metal ring, and as she's walking across, and here's an, an anamorphic uh, perspective drawing of James Joyce. So if you get over here, he kind of he kind of lines up if you get at the right position. Of him. But if, throughout here, the Oscar Wilde is over here. Joyce liked to keep uh, doll underwear in his pocket to, he would t take them out. You can imagine being at uh, dinner with James Joyce. He would take out doll underwear and walk them around to shock people. So there's a, there are a lot of little things that are, that are references to him that are just, that are a part of this piece.